Have you worked with wireless before? I was chief telegrapher on the Minto. I suppose that's why they sent you. Uh, most of what we get here is shipped to shore. Pretty tedious stuff, to be frank. Why are we doing this? We are looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack. Coded messages. How does one tell it's a coded message? Experience. Judgment. I'll be doing that part. Just make sure you jot it all down. Let's get to work. Sir? I think I've got one. Got one what? A coded message. First time's the charm, is it? It's 13 letters that repeat endlessly. It's still transmitting. What happens now? We have a situation, sir. Code M situation. Well done. Who on earth could that be? Hello? Code M. Terence Myers. So, the... Uh, shall I get dressed? No. No, I don't think that's necessary. What's this all about, Mr. Myers? For the last six months, the Canadian government has been intercepting wireless telegraph transmissions. Really? Government no longer believes in the right to privacy? No, of course not. Wireless signals are impossible to trace. It's the perfect medium for enemies of the state to transmit encrypted messages. We received this message approximately one hour ago. And you need my help to decode it? No. Not necessarily, but we believe this one was intended for you. For... Murdoch... Find... J.P. J.P.? James Pendrick? Dr. Janice Kemp's. It's an anagram for James Pendrick. Hello, old friend. James Pendrick. Murdoch. <sighs> Sir, look out! James Pendrick. Detective Murdoch. I believe our old friend may be in need of our assistance. James Pendrick sending you a distress signal. Uh, I believe Mr. Pendrick is using a spark gap transmitter, possibly attached to something mechanical, hence the repetition. I believe I will get dressed. Mm. I've been experimenting with loop antennas mm -hmm. for my radio backpacks. Now, the signal is strongest when the antenna is broadside to the signal. You have this made already? Oh, this won't help you. Uh, the diameter of the antenna needs to match the wavelength of the signal. Uh, what was that frequency again? Mm. 78 MHZ. Megahertz. Multiply the inverse by the speed of light. 299-792-458. Carry the seven. Round to two decimal places, 3.87 meters. Huh. Which is what exactly in English? Uh, 12 feet, roughly. Huh. How long will it take you to make this? Shouldn't be more than a couple of hours for both. Both? Well, yes, you will need two antennas in order to pinpoint the exact location. Triangulation. Oh. 150 
degrees, 9.3. Yes. 150 degrees, 9.4. Yes. 155 degrees, 9.3. 155, 9.3? Yes. 155 minus 65 is 90 degrees. We have a bearing. The signal is coming from this direction. Now to triangulate. Station house number four, please. Oh, no. Uh, <clears throat> Higgins Newsom. Yes, sir, of course I'm still plotting, sir. Yes, we, we've we just had a, a, a few problems, but they've all been all been rectified now. In fact, I think it's all coming together quite nicely. It's more of a line. Uh, quite, quite, uh, I think it's right. The truth is I fell asleep for just a second, sir, but I am fully awake now. I probably... Uh, What's going on? Sir, Detective Murdoch's on the... Murdoch. Of course it's Murdoch. Who else would it be? No, I am still here, sir. I'm I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm right back to it. Sir. I, oh, gee, uh, are you still there? Sir? Oh, no, yes, I've got it. Yes. We're losing the signal. Are you sure? The antenna is fixed at 155 degrees, but we're now 5.9 and dropping. Henry, do you have a node? A, a what, sir? Uh, the graph, does it have a, a, a shape? Like a wave. It just seems to be going down, sir. The signal was being broadcast along this bearing. I want a room by room search of every building along that line. Get the addresses from the fire map. If that's all right with you, sir. Well, if Pendrick's asking to be found, it means he's in trouble. Get to it, lads. Thank you, Henry. Sorry. Hey, Inspector, a uh, body has been pulled out of the river just south of Queen Street. You take it, was. Uh, certainly. Thank you, sir. That's Pendrick's assistant. Svetlana Tsilkovsky. Yes, sir, we've asked her to come in. Of course. Carry on, middle. I'm afraid I haven't seen James for several months. What happened? His dog became sick and had to be killed. And James was inconsolable for weeks. I lost my patience. I said to him, it's just a dog. He didn't see it that way. He stopped speaking to me. He wouldn't even look at me, so I left. My heart was broken. What has happened to my beloved James? I, I don't know. We're just looking for him. You're not alone. A man came to my door three days ago. He was uh, very tall, he had a beard. He gave me this card. I was to call him if James contacted me. Walsh Tyler. He said he was investor. He was found on the banks of the Don River this morning. He was beaten quite severely by the looks of it. Was the beating the cause of death? That won't be determined until the post-mortem. Same with the time of death, I'm afraid. Thank you. Do you have a name? Not yet. Took a bit of a pasting, didn't he? Uh, yes, but not with a fist. Some kind of weapon was used. Henry, I'd like you to go to this address and find out what you can about this man. He was asking about James Pendrick. Walsh Tyler. Yes, if he's there, bring him in. He's tall, beard, I'd like a word with him. Sure. Julia? I know this man. You do? You recognize him? His name is Dr. Quinlan. I don't know his first name. He shared an office with a colleague of mine at university. He studied immunology. And this colleague's name? Gatlin, Professor John Gatlin. Then I best talk to him uh, once we find out more about what happened to the unfortunate Dr. Quinlan.
He's been dead two days, judging by stomach contents. Still trying to determine what weapon was being used. It was wide and flat. Mm, cricket bat? Uh, possibly. No bruising to the forearms? No, just the shoulders. Why would he not defend himself? Is this the cause of death? I'm not sure. I might know more when I take a look at his brain. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> Professor Gatlin, do you have any idea why someone would want to harm Dr. Quinlan? N none at all. He, he, was, he was highly regarded in his field. Uh, as a matter of fact, he, he, he believed he was on the cusp of a major medical breakthrough. What was it? He wouldn't say. Um, his partner insisted on secrecy. Who was his partner? A man by the name of Pendrick. James Pendrick. How long had Dr. Quinlan been working with Mr. Pendrick? A couple of months. It, it wasn't entirely smooth sailing, but they, they must have had some success because they, they filed a patent. What kind of patent? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just learned that much from an investor who came by the office. An investor? Was his name Walsh Tyler? Um, I'm afraid he didn't say. Was he tall with a beard? Uh, yes, yes, he was. I, I, I'm afraid I, I don't know much else. Um, he, he, was, he was looking for Dr. Quinlan. All I knew was their laboratory was up in Weston. It appears to have been abandoned. Someone hastily. William, look. Something terrible happened here. Could this be where Dr. Quinlan was beaten? Not beaten. Thrown up against the wall. With real force. That would explain the bruising I saw. This door doesn't open from the inside. Dr. Quinlan was imprisoned? Or he was thrown in there with someone who was. What on earth was Mr. Pendrick up to? William, look. What do you make of this? That's James Pendrick's handwriting. Was he testing compounds? I think not. Potassium iodine is a compound, but argon is inert. Let's see. I wonder. William, it smells Karnacki. Joseph Karnacki. The man who invented the microwave death ray. It's a man you both knew. That can't be a coincidence. James Pendrick is sending me a message. Wagno? Wagon. Karnacki's wagon. It had to be specially designed to handle the weight of the microwave death ray. That desk. There is something inside of it.
Your Dr. Quinlan beat himself to death by the looks of it. What was James Pendrick working on that would cause a man to do such a thing? Some kind of drug that induces violent rage? Uh, sir, I went to the address specified on the card, but the office was empty. They've moved. It's like he was never there, sir. Everything was in place, but there were no files on the drawers. Perhaps it's a front. We searched every building along the line of bearing. On both sides? Yes, sir. And nothing. I'm sorry. Right, Henry, I'd like you to locate Professor Gatlin and have him meet us at Pendrick's laboratory. Right away? Oh, uh, Violet Hart is asked to see you as well. Yes, that might explain the pattern of bruising, but it wasn't his injuries that killed Dr. Quinlan. It wasn't? No, I found signs of severe inflammation of the brain and surrounding tissue. Oh, my goodness. Acute encephalitis. I've never seen anything like it. I have. Not to this degree, but in medical school, I dissected the brain of a rabid squirrel. Rabies? No ordinary rabies. The extent of the inflammation is astonishing. He must have been in agony. Miss Tselkowski told me that Mr. Pendrick's dog was recently ill and had to be put down. Rabies, you think? According to Tselkowski, this happened about three months ago. He'd been working with Dr. Quinlan for two months. Perhaps the passing of his pup prompted Pendrick to pursue a cure. And in so doing, this man somehow contracted an even more potent form of the disease? We need to talk to an expert. Rat brain, lateral slice, white matter stain. There is inflammation in the ventricles. Yes, you're right. Still in its early stages. P.I. plus one hour? Post-infection. So he was sampling every hour? Uh, P.I. plus two uh, means it's definitely more advanced. But I was under the impression that rabies took weeks to manifest itself. Not necessarily. Rabies normally infects the uh, nerves near the bite. It then travels up those nerves towards the central nervous system. As long as it remains in the peripheral nerves, the immune system or a vaccine can attack it. But once inside the central nervous system, the disease is protected by the blood-brain barrier. The which? A few years back, Max Lewandowski theorized that every blood vessel in the brain is encased in a semi-permeable membrane that admits essential molecules like oxygen that blocks blood-borne pathogens. Like rabies. Yeah. <laughs> Ironically, the, uh, the antibodies that might fight the disease are prevented from getting to the brain. So how did this progress so quickly? Did they inject it directly into their brains? Mm, if that were the case, uh, you'd see more localized inflammation, but as you can see... It's everywhere, all at once, suggesting it was delivered by the blood, which means that James Pendrick must have created a strain of rabies that could breach the blood-brain barrier. That must have been why they were seeking a patent. For an accelerated form of rabies? No. I don't think so. Professor, look. Oh, my word. What is it? This shows inflammation that has receded. PT? Post-therapy. He'd found a way to deliver a cure. Any cure that could pass by the blood-brain barrier would be worth a fortune. Well, then why wasn't Dr. Quinlan cured? Perhaps the cure was intentionally withheld? Have either of you wandered through this part of the room since we've returned? No, why? Someone has. And they're still here. Toronto police, come out of there and identify yourself. Professor Gatlin, do you recognize this man? Yes, that's the man I spoke to last week. You're Walsh Tyler. That is not my true identity. Then who are you? I'm Agent Felder. I work for the American Secret Service. Before we proceed, I think it would be best if we include my Canadian counterpart. Agent Myers. I might have guessed the American government was mixed up in all of this. Then you would have guessed wrong. Why do you say that? As Agent Myers can attest, government is not a beast speaking with one mind. It's a hydra with a thousand heads all talking against each other, and that is especially true of the American Secret Service. But you all take direction from your president. Not all of us. 
There are rogue elements inside the American Secret Service who seek to destroy him. Why? President Roosevelt has proven himself dangerous to some very powerful people. The robber barons. Capitalists of every stripe are chafing at the new regulations. They stand to lose millions, and there's nothing they can do to stop him. His reforms are very popular. Their only hope is to replace him with a puppet who aligns with their interests. And you believe such a plot is afoot now? Three weeks ago, we uncovered evidence of a group of rogue agents calling themselves the Soldiers of Columbia. They're plotting to overthrow the administration. Soldiers of Columbia. They're led by a former agent. You know him as Alan Clegg. Clegg? It's impossible. Clegg is dead. We've seen proof. Is this the proof you've seen? Clegg is dead. Hanged October 7th, 1906. These were taken after the post-mortem. They've completed the Y section. So he is dead? Very much so. It's definitely Alan Clegg. I'm quite sure. Look at the right eye. It was hit with shrapnel. It looks like he lost it. Proof enough for me. The photograph was taken at the Washington City Morgue. He has a very convincing Y section. How do you explain that? It's real. The Y section. Good Lord. Whatever your opinion is of the man, I think we can all agree. He's tough. Any success, Mr. Pendrick? Not as yet. That's unfortunate. You see, I'm under some time pressure here. I'd hate to think you were stalling. I'm working as fast as I can. What you're asking is difficult. Not as difficult as failure. Let me assure you. What does all of this have to do with James Pendrick? All we know is that the soldiers of Columbia are following his work. Mr. Pendrick appears to have stumbled upon an accelerated form of rabies. Gentlemen, I believe this signal has returned. Southeast 9.3. 9.3. We've determined the bearing of the signal at College and Bathurst to be coming from 155 degrees. Once we determine the second bearing, we'll be able to pinpoint the location of the signal exactly. And we have one, sir. What is it? 155 degrees. That's odd. Th that's the same as the first, Henry. Have you dropped a bollock, Higgins? Oh, no, no, actually. Actually, it makes perfect sense. That's why the signal returned to us. At night, radio waves reflect off the ionosphere. The, the what? what? It's being broadcast from below the horizon. Well, what does that mean? Well, sir, it's coming from beyond our border. When we expanded our triangulation to account for the ionosphere, we found this. It's Lewiston. That was my initial thought. It's not Lewiston. We happen to know there's a secret American base. That no longer exists and was never much of a secret. Where then? The American government maintains a secret underground research facility here. Goat Island. What kind of research? You know, I can't divulge that. Uh, nerve gas, bacterial weapons. If Clegg has control of the island, that means this conspiracy is wide, as well as deep. We best inform the president, then. I'll call the prime minister. I'd advise against that. President Roosevelt is not a cautious man. He'll launch a full assault. Your friend will be killed. The soldiers of Columbia will escape. Now, I've been tracking these fellas for almost a year. I can't, I can't allow them to escape. Well, then what do you suggest? We'll contact my counterpart in Washington. He'll bring a team with him. That will take days. James Pendrick is in mortal danger now. We're not just going to be shut about on our backsides. Then let's go together. I know the facility. I know how to get in. We're on the same side here, Terrence. Let's work together to rescue Pendrick and arrest the men that want to destroy my country. I think you should take me with you. 
And don't be ridiculous. She's a woman. I'm a medical doctor. Do any of you feel qualified to comment on Mr. Pendrick's research? She has a point. I'll hold the fort. The doctor goes. Now, there are two surface entrance points, but any attempt to breach them will trigger an alarm. Can the alarm be disabled? Not from the outside. What about guards? Well, that depends on how many people he brought with him. If it's an underground facility, it would need to be ventilated. Yes, and that will be our means of ingress. Now, the intake shaft extends to the cliff face here. Once inside, we're going to have to split up. You and I will try to locate and neutralize Clegg and his men. You two try to find Pendrick and form him. Now, the only thing we won't have, unfortunately, is a means to communicate. Ah. Low-range transmitters. I trust we all know Morse code. Pendrick is likely being held in the laboratory here. Concentration than motivation. Are you gonna beat me up again? <laughs> I can see Mr. Pendrick. No, that hurts my knuckles. Uh -huh. It's my understanding you have a trick shoulder, easily dislocated. Here we go. You know, Give Mr. Him Pendrick, this. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that at any moment I could get one of my boys here to help speed up the process if I really needed to. You're going about this in the wrong way. I can solve this. I just need more time. You've awakened me now. Leave me to my work. What's this? Karnaki. Who's Karnaki? Potassium, argon, sodium, potassium iodide. Don't you know chemical formulas when you see them? I'm going to enjoy hurting you. Get back to work. Sleep deprived, but otherwise fine. I take it you received my signal. Yes, thank goodness. How on earth did you send it? But they have an electric clock. I attached a new wheel to the minute hand and had it brushed by a wire in a sequence of dots and dashes. It's ingenious. For the antenna, I use this marvelous oh. lamp. He's receiving a message from the others. The others? Terence Myers and an American agent. Uh, on their way back, Clegg asleep, others also soon. What happened, Mr. Pendry? What happened was I... I put a bullet between the only eyes that ever trusted me completely. Your dog contracted rabies? Yes. And I swore no man would ever have to go through what I did. So you attempted a cure? I read everything I could. There was so much unknown. I wanted to experiment, but rabies takes weeks to manifest. I needed a version of the disease that would take days at best. So you teamed up with Dr. Quinlan? Yes, and we succeeded in creating a strain that breached the blood-brain barrier. Instant rabies. Symptomatic within an hour, dead within three. It sped up our research by a factor of a thousand. We found a way to use the virus as a Trojan horse to smuggle the antibodies through the blood-brain barrier. You turned the disease against itself. Unfortunately, it only worked on the disease that we created. Not conventional rabies. No. I was prepared to abandon the project, but our work attracted the interest of men who had other uses for it. Clegg intends to weaponize this disease. Yes. Well, of course, uh, weaponized rabies is only useful if one can be inoculated against its effects. One needs the cure as well as the disease. Yes. That is what Mr. Clegg and his soldiers of Columbia seek. 
What he intends to do with it, I have no idea. Terence Myers. Mr. Pendrick. I'm Agent Felder. We've come to get you out of here, Mr. Pendrick. Once we're safe, I'll call in reinforcements. We must go. They could return at any moment. Yes, let's make haste. Hello, gentlemen. Clay, how's the eye? Doctor, we've been expecting you. I'm a little disappointed in all of you, really, especially you, Felder. Of all people, you should know never, never underestimate me. How did you know, Clegg? Soldiers of Columbia have a thousand eyes that never close. It's how we knew Mr. Pendrick had created the most terrifying disease humanity has ever seen. And we couldn't let that go to waste. You intend to use this to rule the world? Terrence. Terrence, no, not even I'm that ambitious. Our goals are very specific. Your plan is to assassinate President Roosevelt. No, we intend to convince him to resign his office. He would never resign. Well, he will have a strong incentive once we infect all of his children with Mr. Pendrick's innovation. The new president will be one of yours. He'll invade Canada and your fantasy of manifest destiny will at last be a reality. Yes, yes. But first, I need a cure. I'm not an immunologist. The person who could create the cure you seek is dead. Dr. Quinlan. He tested the cure on himself. Didn't work. Finding a cure for humans will take time. I don't have time. And I don't think I need it. I think you have a cure, Mr. Pendrick. I think you have a cure, and you've been stalling. And I'm going to put that theory to the test. No! Julia, no! If Mr. Pendrick has the cure, she will live. And if not, well, you've seen the film. Julia. Is he right? Do you have a cure? That depends. Are you familiar with Lion Sunner's blood groupings? They've identified four. A, B, O, and A, B. I'm type A, B. As am I. Dr. Quinlan, unfortunately, was type A. Highly agglutinative. Perhaps the agglutinants blocked the passage of the antigen? Do you have a cure? Yesterday, I injected myself with the rabies. And then the antigens. And you're still here? Yes. I grew some symptoms, but they quickly receded. Then it should work for me with the same type. My arm is twitching. That's the first sign. It will move quickly now. <laughs> Quick, find her to the chair. We have to think this through. If Clegg finds out we have the cure, he'll kill us all. I don't That's care. That's precisely why I've been dragging my feet. <sighs> Hendrik, the cure! It's right here, Maroc. <sighs> so, progress? Well, we're moving as quickly as we can. Oh. Fascinating. I've heard that people with rabies have a fear of water. Is that true? Stop it. <laughs> you look at that. Oh! 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 What do I do? What do I do? Bathe it in alcohol. Full immersion. You want to be quick about it. Quick. Get me alcohol! Pendrick! Inject her. Hold her. Steady, Julia. Steady. Relief is on the way. Get more alcohol! Go get more I need alcohol. more! Julia, speak to me. It's working. Here. I'll take the cure. One move, and I smash it. Murdoch. Grab him. He's working with Clegg. Well, well, well. What do we have here? How'd you know, Murdoch? Clegg knew we'd seen the film. Only one other person knew that. He's the reason Clegg knew we were coming. Huh. Your phone call to Washington was actually a phone call here. Of course, I should have known. You fool, still think you can escape. All I need to do... Ah! Rabies? Barbiturates. <sighs> hey! More alcohol! Get me more alcohol! Oh, God. Where are we? Somewhere on the island still.
still. We have to make it to the mainland. Which way to the bridge? Let's get to the river first and find our bearings. What happened? What happened? What happened? They got the cure. They even... File. They're taking it with them. After them! No, 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 this way. Close to the water now. We're on the wrong side. Damn. We're gonna have to double back. Where? Yeah. Where is it? Where is what? The cure! Give it to me. Shoot them! Shoot them and you'll be licking this off the rocks. your survival. Just give me the cure, and I will let you live. If you don't give me the cure, I will tear you limb from limb. You best do what I say. I won't be staying much longer. Don't, Murdoch. I will whip you all apart! Give it to me! Give it to me! Murdoch. No! no! He's dead. He was a brute. But I take no pleasure in his demise. See him? Nope. He made it to the other side. Well, if anything, he's proven hard to kill. He has indeed. Let's get back to Canada. The Americans have picked up Agent Felder and are questioning him as we speak. Any word on Clegg? Oh. I doubt he could survive the falls and rabies. Well, over the years, he's proved to be tough. How's Julia? The doctors have given her a clean bill of health. Your cure works, Mr. Pendrick. Mm. Thank God for that. James. Svetlana. I brought you a gift. A gift? <laughs> For me. I'm sorry about your dog. Truly, I am. It's I who should apologize. Is it all right? Forgive me. I, I don't know what kind you'd like. He's perfect. I'll name him Quinlan. Hello, Quinlan. Oh, James. Oh, Quinlan. <laughs> So, you are no longer infectious? Not in the least. But I must confess, I do continue to feel some effects. Oh? To be honest, I may still have a bit of the beast in me. George. So you're not satisfied? No, George, I just want bigger. All right. So should we go take another look at it? We don't need to. It has everything we could want. Wait, it's all the way over in the annex. 
I mean, it's not exactly the center of town. Exactly, George. It's a quiet home for a family that we can call our own. It's perfect. Thank you, Stevens. Ah, oh, Murdoch, there you are. Just give me a minute. Lads, can I have your attention, please? I have an announcement that affects you all. I've recently received word that my aunt is on her last legs back in Yorkshire. As such, the missus and I have arranged passage back to England. Therefore, a new inspector will be appointed in my absence. Murdoch, my office. This won't be good. Well, the inspector's hardly a soft touch, Henry. How much worse could it be? Shut the door. Have a seat, Murdoch. I've had a word with the chief constable. It's the board's decision, but I've recommended you. Recommendations have hardly made a difference in the past. He thinks it could be different this time. Because it's only an interim position, he feels they may not pay attention. I see. I would be honored to fill the position of inspector until you return. Well, here's the thing, Murdoch. I'm not quite ready to tell my boys yet, but Margaret and I have been talking for some time about retiring to Yorkshire. Retiring? The truth is, it's more likely than not that when I get on that boat, I won't be coming back. Oh, I... I don't know what to say, sir. I... Goodbye will do just fine. Do you really think they'll let you be inspector this time? Well, it seems that my appointment in the interim is all but assured. All but? Yes, well, I realize we've been down this road before, but I can't simply stay in the same position the rest of my life. It's time for the next challenge. And at the moment, it seems that challenge has arrived. Well, I hope it has. I'm afraid my next challenge has fallen away. Oh? The funding for the women's hospital has been denied. There's always private money? I think we've raised all we can. We needed the government to at least match some of the funding, but they've refused. Governmental budgets are annual. There's always next year. Perhaps, but they've made it clear. Our endeavor is not of value in their eyes. It's time to give up the dream. Detective, there you are. Mr. Banks, I take it you're here about the inspector position. Indeed. I believe you know my son-in-law, the Crown Attorney? Yes, of course. Nice to see you again, Mr. Templeton. You as well. Now, I know Alan once fought to have you appointed inspector, and I never stood in the way. I want you to know that. So far as I'm concerned, Catholic or Protestant, it's best man for the job. Thank you, sir. Yes. Well, the Board of Control has spoken with the Chief Constable, and we have come to a decision. Constables, gather round, will you? It's time to introduce you to your new inspector. I'll make this brief so you can all get back to work. Your new inspector is a detective I believe you all know and have worked with. His reputation precedes him thanks to his fine work these past years. So would you please welcome your new inspector, Detective Edwards from Station House One. Congratulations, inspector. It's my honor. Thank you, Mr. Banks. I very much look forward to working with all of you. Sir, I'm so sorry. No need to be sorry, George. Uh, these things happen. Well, you had to expect a promotion, sir. It's more than deserved overdue, I would say. Well, perhaps some things are just out of our control, George. Perhaps some of us are never meant to move up in the world, sir. Just stay where we are until we retire or die. Thank you, George. Detective Murdoch, why don't we sit down in my office? Five minutes. Let us clear the air, Detective. I know you wanted this job. Perhaps you deserved it, but you didn't get it. If you have any grievance regarding this matter, I hope you understand when I say I don't want to hear it. I want only to get to work. I have no grievance. Good. It's not lost on me that I'm a younger man than yourself with less experience. Is this going to pose a problem for you, given my new position? 
I don't see how it's relevant, so long as we both do our jobs. Your former inspector had a reputation for involving himself in cases when the situation called for it. I operate no differently. Your cases will be your own, but we will work together. Understood? Understood. Sir, we have a call from a flop house on River Street. Oh. Let us go to River Street, detective. Between the two of us, we'll make short work of this. He appears he was strangled with a lamp cord. Was this his room? Apparently, it was rented by a woman. I see. Well, you know what that means. No money in his pockets. A robbery, then. He pays the lady for her time. She decides she wants more. Or he refused to pay? Entirely possible. Either way, she maneuvers him into a vulnerable position, ends his short life, and takes whatever she pleases. A price you pay for such a life? Identification? None. Huh. Sirs, this chap has some information. Oh, enlighten us. I know exactly when the murder happened. 2.55 uh, a.m. How can you be so precise? Another guest complained about the noises coming from the room. I came upstairs to check. And he was dead when you arrived? No. When I was on the stairs, I heard a fracas. A window broke, and then she fled. Oh, you saw her? No. But I heard her running out the back door. And this was 2.55 a.m.? To the minute. So you saw this man and his companion when they arrived here approximately one hour earlier? That's right. And what did she look like? Plain. Did you get her name? He called her Francesca. A killer has a name. Sirs, I think I know this man. Not associating with his ilk, I hope, Crabtree? No, sir. Well, yes, actually. I believe his name is Langley. Constable Langley. Station House 3. We believe her name is Francesca, and she may be responsible for the murder of Constable Archibald Langley. We need to find her. Ask every man, woman, and child to look at this picture. Any information will be very useful. We know two things. She is a killer. And she is a lady of the evening. Brothels, bordellos, houses of ill repute. I want everyone in the city turned upside down. And bring them all in. And while you're at it, arrest the men visiting them. It takes two to commit a carnal sin, and we at the constabulary do not discriminate. Our killer is likely hiding in one of these dens of iniquity. And the more pressure we put on these heathens, the more likely one of her ilk will crack and tell us where she is. Now, I'm prepared to reward you for your efforts. You'll receive a bonus of 50 cents for every arrest. Now, get to it. Sir, are you sure that's necessary? What, you want to find her, don't you? Well, yes, of course, but... Perhaps so many lads on the one case is not the best use of resources. I mean, give us 24 hours to find this Francesca, and maybe all this won't be necessary. It may not be necessary for finding our killer, but it is necessary nonetheless. Look at this. Toronto is rotten to the core. It's time to clean it up. Mr. Langley's cause of death is asphyxiation, but he also has a significant wound on the back of his head. Recent? Very. From the severity, I would guess he was dazed or unconscious when he was strangled. What could have caused that? It's impossible to say. Something blunt, uh, perhaps the floor or a wall, hmm. anything. Not inconsistent with our findings. But this may be. He was not killed with the cord that was around his neck. You said asphyxiation. Indeed, but with something thicker. Whatever killed him was most likely leather, one inch wide. A belt or a strap? I'll leave that to you. Higgins, who are those lads? Men Edwards brought over from Station House One. I don't like this one bit. Well, what's the big deal? We're just doing our jobs. Well, it seems like a fool's errand, Henry. There's a reason it's the world's oldest profession. What can we possibly accomplish? Besides, make life more difficult for people 
less fortunate than us. At least we'll make some extra money. Well, I'll catch up with you. I've got some information for the detective. <sighs> Sir, I spoke to a witness who saw a woman fleeing the scene, but the timing doesn't seem to match up. Oh? Yes. Well, she swears she saw this Francesca at 2.45 a.m. Ten minutes before the clerk said he heard her running out the back door. Wait, but the witness works at a bakery where she arrived on time at 3 a.m. It's a 15-minute walk. She swears she didn't leave a minute after 2.45. So either she or the clerk is mistaken. Or we're missing something. Let's have a look. Right. So if she came out this door, this direction is a dead end, so she had to have come this way. Sir, look at this. Yes, that's the broken glass from the window above. No, underneath it here. Oh. The glass was very much on top of this. So if this was Francesca's... Then she came through here before the window broke. The baker saw her at 2.45? And the clerk heard a... Fracas. Fracas at 2.55. Someone else was in the room with Langley. Likely the killer. Very good, George. telling me she's innocent. Yes, the crime scene was staged. The killer, likely a man, placed the cord around the victim's neck. Can you finish that later, please? To what end? To make it appear as though the woman killed Langley and used something that was found in the room when, in reality, the killer likely brought the implement himself. Well, what was the killer's motive? I have no idea, sir. Perhaps the killer saw the two of them go into the hotel and saw it as an opportunity to rob the man while he was in a vulnerable state. And it's Francesca? She likely fled the scene the moment the intruder appeared, and based on what she saw, isn't inclined to come forward. All right. Fine work. But it hardly changes our intentions. Francesca saw the killer, ergo we must find her as quickly as possible. We'll keep the constables working on the bordellos. Uh, yes, on that matter, I assume it would be all right if I took one of them with me to assist me in my investigation. Of course. Take your pick. Mrs. Langley, your husband was found at the River Street Hotel. We believe he had been in the company of a woman. He was a God-fearing man, Archie. He never would have been with a harlot. Did he happen to say where he had been going all of these evenings? No. Last week he had a message by courier, though. He's never had one of those. What was the message? I never saw it. He took it with him. But I kept the envelope. I was saving that. What, the envelope? Yes. To use over again, you mean? Of course. There you are. Thank you. It looks like office. So what's this? R-T-H-O-U-S-E? Rathouse? Rathouse? Courthouse. Possibly. Templet. I believe I know who wrote this note. George? Constable Langley is dead. Dear God. Found strangled to death in a seedy hotel on River Street. Terrible thing. The young man had a family, too, as I recall. It's my understanding that he met with you last week. That's right. He was working on a case that his superiors had already closed. He suspected someone was trying to cover it up. Who? He wasn't sure. He said he was close to finding out, but felt that taking it to his inspector was not an option. He asked if he could bring his findings directly to me. I said, yes, of course. Thank you. Um, what case? He didn't tell me. He said he wanted to wait until the evidence was in place. I wish I could be of more help, gentlemen. 
Thank you. He had been gathering evidence. So perhaps he had a file or, or notes of some sort. Well, nothing was found at his house, nor in his desk at Station House 3. He was hiding his investigation from his superiors. George, perhaps you should go to Station House Number 3 and look in his desk yourself. Sir, I will do. I was hoping to take a moment to meet with Effie, though. Yes, of course. Having lunch? We actually have a meeting at the bank. We're thinking about buying a house in the annex. Oh, George, congratulations. That's terrific. Although, are you sure you want to live that far from the city? Mm. Well, now we just have to see if we're approved. It's an awfully big mortgage, Jeff. Are you sure we're doing the right thing? George, we both have good jobs and savings. Maybe I'll start rounding up vagrants to make some extra dollars. Vagrants? Vagrants, gamblers, drunkards, women of the night. It's this new inspector. He has an eye to clean up Toronto. And his solution is to arrest half the population? It seems so. Well, that won't last long. What's the Crown going to do with hundreds of petty cases to try? They can't keep up. The cells are already full. I'll make some calls. Perhaps I can act as surety to get some of them released. Hmm. It's completely ridiculous. Are you having to participate in all this? Well, thus far, I've been too busy helping the detective. Speaking of which... I want to thank you all for your excellent work thus far. Some of you will receive a pretty penny, thanks to my little incentive. The time has come to expand our purview. Speakeasies, clubs, burlesques, gambling dens, deviancy in all its forms will find no safe harbor under our watch. Uh, sir, aren't nightclubs and burlesques perfectly legal? They may have their permits, but that doesn't mean the goings on in these institutions aren't in contravention of the law. Any institution built on sin is morally unacceptable. The laws reflect the morals of the people, and it is time to start enforcing them. Constable, where have you been? At Station House 3, at the request of the detective. Is that so? Because Constable Tucker here says he saw you socializing with a woman. That was my wife. We had an appointment at the bank. Is that something you normally do while at work? No, sir. It was important. We're trying to purchase a house. Congratulations. Listen, Crabtree, I'm a generous man by nature, but I won't be taken advantage of. I'm gonna make up the time at the end of your shift. Come on, lads. Got a job to do. You too, Higgins. was investigating was strangled with a length of something likely leather one inch wide identical to Langley then perhaps she got herself mixed up with a powerful man and threatened to expose him murder to avoid scandal it wouldn't be the first time these notes contain several abbreviations that make it very difficult to understand N B O W. sir I haven't the faintest there's also something here about Francesca. The woman we're looking for. He was meeting with her, perhaps to discuss this case. Well, perhaps she was a witness or a friend of the victims. So look at this Talman's photograph studio with an address. This appears to have been torn out of a diary. George, look at the date. The same day Langley was killed. Perhaps we should pay Mr. Talman a visit. Cassie? Cassie? Violet? There you are. I don't understand. We have our permits. Well, apparently the new inspector is cracking down on undesirable establishments in town. 
You ran. I had no choice. You could have tried to stand up to them. You're a powerful person, Violet. It wouldn't have done any good. That may be so. You could have stood with the salon. With me? And got arrested? To prove some kind of point? Yes. To take a stand, sacrifice yourself, to make an example. That is how change is made. That is not how the world works. At least this way I'm on the outside and I can help you get out of here. Sorry to bother you, we have a few questions. What's this about? Did a Constable Archibald Langley come visit you recently? Langley? Why, yes. He came in with a woman. Oh. Uh, who was this woman? I didn't get her name. Is this the woman you're talking about? That's her. The two of them came asking after another woman named Olivia Wright. Who is Olivia Wright? A customer of mine. She developed photos a few weeks ago, but Constable Langley told me that she was dead. What a shame. Oh. Did you know her well? Only as a customer. Wait, you can't think I had anything to do with it. I, I, I would never, ever... No, Mr. Talman, you are not under suspicion at this time. Sir, do you think Olivia Wright could be our unidentified woman? Well, George, her initials do correlate to the abbreviations found in Mr. Langley's files. Mr. Talman, do you recall what Miss Wright came into your store for? Constable Langley asked me the same thing. She had photos developed, and she came back here to pick them up, and apparently she was murdered that very day. What were the photos of? Just pictures of a man in bed, sleeping. Who was the man? I didn't recognize him. Do you think you could recognize him out of a sequential lineup of men? I doubt it. I didn't think it was very important. Thank you, Mr. Talman. Langley's file made note that there were ashes found in a waste paper basket at the scene of the murder. The photos she picked up? Perhaps. Perhaps the killer burned them to get rid of them because he was the man in the photographs. They were having a liaison. Mm. And they were her proof. But she was killed before she could tell anybody. We need to find out all we can about this Olivia Wright. And while we're at it, we need to find Francesca. I know that name. Olivia was an old friend of Archibald's. How did they know each other? He used to work with her before he became a constable. They were both servants for a wealthy man. Who? I don't know. Do you know anyone who might know? That was all before Archie and I met. I'm sorry, Detective. Mighty fine job you've done, Edwards. Thank you, sir. Toronto already feels far safer than it did before. Good day, Constable Crabtree. Inspector. I'm so glad that you... Sir, away I've been asking around about Olivia Wright. I can't find any record of her anywhere. No matter. I've just found something very interesting in Constable Langley's notes. George, we now know that OW stands for Olivia Wright. And that makes some of these other entries far more clear. For example... I believe Francesca also worked as a servant in the same household as Olivia Wright. So they did know each other. Which would explain why Francesca was valuable to Constable Langley's investigation. She would have had information about anything happening to Miss Wright in that household. Exactly. Now there's just this other one that he keeps referring to, B.O.C. More initials? B.O.C., possibly. A person, place? Board of Control. Sir, brilliant. And next to BOC is MB. Somebody with the initials MB at the Board of Control. George. Melvin Banks is on the Board of Control. Constable Langley once asked you to bypass his superiors. I have you here to ask for the same thing, for the same reasons. And uh, I hope your promise to help still stands. Of course. What have you found out? 
I believe the killer to be Melvin Banks. My father-in-law. I, I understand this must be very upsetting given that he's family. <sighs> family in a sense of the word, but there is no love lost between us. I have always disagreed with his methods. If he really is a killer, then justice comes first. Are you sure he's guilty? The case is lacking in physical evidence, but yes. What do you need from me? I intend to interview Banks and ask him if he has an alibi for the night in question. And if he doesn't, I'll arrest him. Obviously, I'll need to go over Edward's head. We've had our differences in the past, but you're a good detective. If you say the case is strong, I'll back you up. Crabtree, job for you. We've just received an anonymous tip. There's to be an illegal gathering at a home in Rosedale. What kind of gathering? You'll see. Find Higgins and a few others. Sir. Arrest all in attendance. Yes, I asked the inspector at Station House 3 to shut down that investigation. Because you were the one who murdered Olivia Wright to cover up the liaison you were having with her. Oh, of course not. I had no affair with her, and I certainly didn't kill her. Then why order the case closed? Because I didn't want any of this nasty business associated with my good name. Can you imagine what the press would have said? One of my servants engaging in sex for money on her day off? Did you not think the young woman deserved justice? I assumed it was some seedy criminal who had long absconded. Exposing the details would have only put the poor girl's family through more pain. So you told them what? She left town? It was kinder than telling them the truth. I gave them money. It was better for everyone. And Francesca? My maid. What about her? She had been working with Constable Langley to find out what happened to Olivia Wright. Well, I don't know anything about that. She hasn't been at work the past few days, but I have no idea where she's disappeared to. And I hadn't even heard of Archibald Langley until he turned up dead. I swear. Where were you Tuesday at 3 a.m.? At home in bed. With? No one. My wife's in Montreal for the month. And November 21st? I haven't any idea. What's November 21st? The night that Olivia Wright was murdered. You're going to arrest me, detective? Go ahead. As you wish. I can't believe you left New York for Toronto the good. It wasn't entirely my decision. You surely miss it. Don't you want to go back? I'm at home here. We've been to many places and lived many lives, but when we're searching within, it's rare the answer lies without. Police! Gentlemen, we have orders to take you down to the station house. It will go easier if you comply in an orderly fashion. Thank you, sir! Thank you. <clears throat> Stop, lads! What? Look who we have here! Take him in. Run. What? Just make a run for it. No, I won't run from this. My friends are getting arrested. So am I. Detective Murdoch, can you tell me why I have a member of the Board of Control in my cells? I've arrested him for the murders of Olivia Wright and Archibald Langley. And why didn't I know anything about this? You seemed more preoccupied with your raids. Besides, the Crown Attorney has already agreed to take the case. You went over my head. I felt it was necessary. Do you respect me, Detective Murdoch? I don't see how that's at all relevant to the matter at hand. Do you trust my judgment? Did you think that if you came to me about this, I would have shut the case down? That's precisely what I thought. 
You've proven time and again that your priorities are askew. You are more interested in arresting the destitute than you are murderers. Yeah, you wait just a second. Sir, there's news from the morgue. We'll continue this later, detective. Appears to be her. The killer got to her first. She's been dead 24 hours. Killed by a stabbing, not strangulation, like Olivia Wright and Constable Langley. Men say she was found in an alley behind their social club, her servants. She must have been hiding from the police. So it's your contention that Banks found her and killed her to keep her quiet? I'm not so sure. If Miss Hart's timeline is correct and Francesca died 24 hours ago, then Mr. Banks had an alibi for the time of the murder. Oh. He still could have done the other two, I suppose. Our murder could be unrelated. But why would someone else want to kill Francesca? Perhaps Banks sent someone else to kill her. In which case, someone knows the truth. Not a good way to tie up loose ends. No. Sir? Ah, uh, sirs. Uh, we found the room at the social club where Francesca was hiding. There was a note I thought you might want to take a look at. Langley, meet me at River Street Hotel. Info about Olivia, rent room 13, 2.30 a.m. Come alone. Perhaps Francesca wrote this herself. We found some other examples of her handwriting. It's not a match. Someone else, then. Presumably, Langley knew who it was from. And that person turned out to be the actual killer, luring Langley to his death. Francesca arrives moments later, but the killer is not expecting her. She manages to flee. So, the question is clear. Was it Banks? Inspector Edwards, may I have a word? What is it? I think we should let Detective Watts go. He's done nothing wrong, and he's a friend of this station house. Watts has been arrested? What for? He was found attending an illegal gathering that was in clear contravention of the law. Oh, there must be some mistake. What evidence do you have that the gathering was illegal? I know Llewellyn Watts. We have a history. His very presence there confirms precisely what we suspected regarding the gathering. Now, Watts is a good man. He is a sodomite who deserves to be jailed. Just like Mr. Banks, Mr. Watts cannot escape punishment just because he has friends in high places. Sir, there must be something we can... Henry. Apparently, the inspector thinks he knows best. See? That note does not match my handwriting at all. I'm telling you I'm innocent. Then tell me this. How is it that you knew that the unidentified woman referred to in Constable Langley's case file was Olivia Wright? And how did you know Station House 3 had the case in the first place? The case came across my son-in-law's desk, he told me. Alan Templeton? Yes. The handwriting on the envelope matches the handwriting on the note. Owen Templeton is our killer. Mr. Templeton, you wear leather suspenders, don't you? No need to answer that. We've already confirmed that you do, and that they are precisely one inch in width. They are a perfect match for the wounds that were found on Constable Langley's neck, as well as Olivia Wright's. What would compel you to do this? I'll await my lawyer. If you like. But the evidence we have against you is more than enough. Your colleagues at the Crown are not exactly shy about taking the case against you. Your cooperation could spare your life, as you well know. I met Olivia through my father-in-law. I was a frequent visitor in his home. Miss Wright caught your eye, didn't she? 
It's a bit of fun. But then she wanted more of me. She threatened to expose you. Ruin your marriage, your career. So you had to kill her. I would have lost everything. I had to make sure that she would never tell. And I convinced Melvin to use his influence to stop any investigation. Told him that his good name would suffer because she was his servant. He had no idea what I had done. But Constable Langley wouldn't stop the search, would he? You had to kill him as well. I had to stop him. And we had to stop you. Mr. Templeton, you are under arrest. Come on, clear out! The lot of you. Take this as a warning. If you've received no charge, consider it a mercy. I don't want to see hide nor hair of any of you in this city ever again. Because the next time, I won't be so forgiving. This is our home. Where are we supposed to go? Quite frankly, I don't care. As long as it's not in Toronto. Inspector Edwards, all this began with the Langley case. Now, we know his killer was not a prostitute, but rather one of the city's elite. All this, the sweeps have to stop. Certainly not. I have a vision of a clean Toronto, and I will shake every shadow until all of the deviants in this city are gone. What, sir? Stop whining and do your job. It's over, Watts. You're free to go. No, this is far from over. At least you won't be in jail. I'm not leaving Toronto, George. Watts, it's just for... This is all going to blow over eventually. I'm not going anywhere. They can charge me if they want. Watts. I want my day in court. I want a jury to decide to tell me once and for all if who I am makes me a criminal. Well, it took some doing, but the loan is approved. The house is ours. As long as we keep our jobs. Is everything all right? Yes, no, uh, that's wonderful news, Effie. Well, I heard Edwards release the detainees. Hopefully the sweeps will be over soon and things can go back to normal. I'm sure they will. Higgins, you keep your nose clean. You too, sir. Huh? You almost missed us. We're about bored. <laughs> sir, are you sure about this? You take care of this young lady, Bugalooks. You found her good in there. Indeed, I will, sir. And good luck with the new inspector. I'm sure you'll be all right. Well, I'm not so sure about that, but thank you. Maybe we'll come and visit you. We've been talking about doing some traveling. That would be lovely. I can hardly imagine a Toronto without you, sir. I'm not your boss anymore, Murdoch. Call me Tom. We'll miss you, Tom. As we you, William. <laughs> Doesn't sound right, does it? Absolutely not. <laughs> Safe travels, sir. Thank you, Milmucker. We'll send a postcard. <laughs> Well, no use standing on ceremony. Till the next time. Indeed. Margaret? Mm -hmm. Well, we're entering a new world, William. Mm. And I'm not sure I think much of it. I have to tell you, detective. Regardless of your success in this case, I'm still not happy that you went over my head. This is my station house. I'm your boss, and as such, I demand your respect. Respect is earned, not demanded. I need you to fall in line, like the rest of the men. In fact, why don't you start with that speakeasy down by the docks? Hmm? Take a few constables and shut the place down. I will not. Pardon me. This is as good a time as any, I suppose. Though I have been preoccupied with my case, it hasn't stopped me from noticing the disgraceful way that you have been running things here. 
Are you telling me how to do my job? No, I doubt that that would do much good. Get out of my office! I intend to. What do you mean? Consider this my resignation. I'm no longer Detective Murdoch of Station House Number 4. There's a single dose of laudanum by the bed. Take it. It will help with the pain. Is there a doctor in this town? Oh, actually, I am a doctor, but... You're in five minutes of your time. Please. Uh, ma'am, you can't go in there. This is a crime scene. Abigail! I, I, I warned you, ma'am. You need to answer some questions. I left her with a single vial of laudanum. When I went to get the tickets, uh, that's not enough to cause harm. And you're certain it was the correct dosage? Yes, of course. How can you be sure? Uh, well, the I... The absence I... of any other explanation, is it not most likely that Abigail Prescott died because you provided her with the wrong bottle of water? Yes, it's, it's possible. Seven, nine, no eight. There's age missing. This is my interview with the hotel clerk. The last time she saw Mrs. Prescott is when she made a telephone call in the middle of the night. She made a telephone call? Is that important? Yes. The jury has found you guilty of manslaughter in the death of Abigail Prescott. What? <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Murdoch. Good morning, Bethany. Oh, she has been quite the handful this morning. <laughs> well, usually when the little one is fussy like this, Dr. Ogden would sing her a lullaby. Sleep, my baby, on my bosom. Warm and cozy will it prove. Round the mother's arms are folding in her heart a mother's love. Sleep. We need something substantial to justify filing this appeal. Yes, but what about that call? If the alderman knew where we were, he, he could have killed her. The hotel owner didn't hear the telephone conversation that Abigail was having, and the switchboard operator doesn't remember who she put the call through to. It's a dead end. There's no way to prove who she called. <sighs> Why did she make that call? Do you think... She could have been having second thoughts about leaving her husband. I should never have encouraged her. There's no way to know what was in her mind. But you know what was in your heart. You were simply trying to help a woman in need, Julia. Yes, and now that woman is dead. Surely the fact that someone removed a page from the police report should warrant an appeal, shouldn't it? The judge clearly didn't think so. Then we'll speak to a different judge, a higher court. I'm sorry, but it's not enough. A page could go missing for any number of reasons. Any judge will consider it no more than an error. How are you fearing, sir? I feel hopeless, George. I wish there was something I could do. What did Effie have to say? She said we could appeal, but our chances are slim at best. We've lost in the eyes of the court. I can't believe it. Now we're Dr. Ogden in such a dire circumstance. They've sentenced her to three years. For something she didn't do. And, and we'll do everything we can to prove that, sir, to prove it to the court. Of course, George, but it may not be enough. Julia is going to miss raising her daughter. So don't say that. <sighs> her first words, her first steps, three years. She'll be a completely different person by the time her mother gets out of prison. Will she even recognize her? You can't. You can't let these thoughts consume you. I know, George, but it's true. 
Julia is in prison, sleeping in a cot in a windowless room. I I'm spending every day and night trying to raise our daughter without her. I, I just don't think I can do it alone. Sir, you don't have to. No matter what happens, one thing I can promise you, you won't be alone. Thank you, George. Is that the alderman's fundraiser? I believe so. He has some nerve. Thank George. you, thank you, thank George. you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Helping people has always been my mission. Especially when it comes to the people of Toronto. We need state-of-the-art facilities where the average man can get top-of-the-line health care. That is why I want to raise money to open a new hospital for the less fortunate. Oh, that's rich. Now, this here is my friend David. He was born with a bad leg and is one of the many people who will be helped by our new endeavor. Now, he's going to be coming around with a collection tin. If you see him, give him a few dollars. Let's get to our donation goals. Every penny counts. <laughs> Donation chaps? It is a good call, sir. Yeah, every penny counts, you just said. Thanks. Detective Murdoch. Thank you for coming. Despite what has happened, we must rise above and support one another. I'm not here for niceties, Alderman. I have a few more questions. Again, Detective? If I didn't know any better, I'd think you had it in for me. Did you receive a telephone call from your wife the night before her death? No, I didn't. Is that all? Good day, Detective. I know what you did, Prescott. And I won't rest until I prove it. Whatever could you mean? Have you spoke to Julia? How's the spirits? Not good, I'm afraid. Oh, this is a nightmare. What's your next move, Murdoch? I'm sure it was Alderman Prescott. I just can't prove it. He was the recipient of the telephone call that's mentioned in the page of the report that's now conveniently missing. But perhaps the question shouldn't be, why is it missing? But how? The inspector at Port Credit? It was his report. You know you have my full support and the full resources of this station house if you need anything. Thank you, sir. There is another avenue to follow. If we're correct, the alderman had to have traveled from his home in Toronto to Port Credit between the time of the telephone call and when Abigail's body was discovered. Someone may have seen him leave his house that day. Perhaps he hired a carriage. Surely an alderman would own his own carriage. In which case, you'll have a driver. George, Henry, see what you can find out. Yes, sir. I did nothing wrong. And I resent the accusation. A file was sent to the Crown and to the defense. Both were missing the same page of your report. So the incident had to have occurred before the documents left this station house. You're suggesting one of my men lost the page? Or mishandled it? Intentionally. No. My men are honest and trustworthy. Is that so? I, I work with them every day. I trust them with my life. But do you not trust your constables with yours? You hand wrote the page, correct? That's right. Then who copied it? What do you mean? Every page of those documents was collated into two separate files. 
One went to the Crown, one went to the defense. Someone had to have copied the original in order to... Oh, yes, that would be Mr. Johnson, our scrivener. That's him there, if you'll excuse me. Mr. Johnson, Detective Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. I have a couple of questions. Uh, right now, I'm uh, kind of busy. Are you the scrivener that handled the case report for the trial of Dr. Julia Ogden? I am. Are you aware that a page went missing from that report prior to trial? No, I, I don't know anything about that. Can you confidently say that all of the pages were accounted for when you received the report from Inspector McRae? How could I possibly know? <laughs> He attests that as a fact. And yet a page was missing from the files that went to the Crown and the defense. Things get lost all the time. By you? No, never. I, 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 uh... And yet it went missing when it crossed your desk. Perhaps I should have another word with Inspector McRae and advise him not Please. to hire... Don't tell the Inspector. Tell me exactly what happened. Two days before the trial, I ran into a man in the street near my rooms. He knew about the trial, and he even knew that the file was currently in my hands. Who was this man? I'd never seen him before in my life. He offered me a hundred dollars to remove two pages. H how could I pass that up? Two pages, not just one? Uh, one page from the police report, one from the coroner's report. But there was nothing on them, nothing that seemed important. That is not for you to determine, Mr. Johnson. But I, I needed the money. Do you have any idea how much $100 is? My, my wife, I, 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 I needed the money, sir. Please, pull yourself together, man. Look at this photograph. Is this the man that gave you the money? No, I, I don't recognize him. Then who was it? I told you, I'd never seen him before. Uh, the man had a goatee, a uh, rough face. And he talked awful funny. All right. I'll need you to give a description to a sketch artist. Of course. That must be his drawer. We'll see if he knows anything. Yeah, we need to get him on his own so we can talk to him. Right. We have to do whatever we can to get Dr. Ogden back home. She doesn't belong in jail. She has killed someone before. Henry, she's innocent. Oh, look, this is our chance. Excuse me, sir. Yes. How can I help you? Uh, condolences for the passing of Mrs. Prescott. A nasty business, that. We're conducting an additional investigation into her death. Is that right? Uh, should I get the alderman? Uh, no, actually, we wanted to speak to you. Can you tell us anything about the day that Mrs. Prescott died? Did you take the alderman anywhere that day? No. Uh, I was given the afternoon off that day. And are you usually giving the afternoon off? No. Uh, that morning, we went about our business as usual. I took him to his tailor's, then back to the house, just like every day. Uh, usually, I wait around after that, but that day, the alderman went inside the house and came back out a short time later, telling me to take the rest of the day off. Hey, he goes to the tailor's every day? Well, it's his business. He owns it. Uh, impressively pressed tailors over on Sherborne. Oh, I've been there before. Uh, they are very good. Uh, well, it does fine business. Uh, we pick up the earnings there every day and take them to the bank. Every day? Mr. Wright, you are the coroner who performed the postmortem on Abigail Prescott. Uh, th that's right. And you delivered your report to this station house, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. Did you happen to keep a copy of your report for your record? Uh, no, I assumed I would receive it back after the trial. Could you have a look at the report and tell me if there's anything missing? Yeah, yes, there is a page missing. Oh. Any idea what that page contained? Of course, it was the page that detailed the bruising across the victim's body. Bruising? What bruising? Extensive. Arms, back, torso. Any sense of what may have caused them? Likely from repeated blows, but none of this had anything to do with her death. These were minor contusions, painful, but not serious. Thank you, Mr. Wright. 
If I may, did you happen to notice if any of the bruises were more recent than others? Yes, yes, there was one on her arm. Her broken arm? No, her other arm. Uh, it was about a few inches wide, quite fresh. So someone grabbed her? He stole the pages to hide the fact that they'd injured her in an altercation? Or it's an indication of something else altogether. What are you thinking? It's your professional opinion that Abigail Prescott consumed 100 drams of laudanum. Correct. Dr. Ogden maintains that she instructed Abigail Prescott to consume one vial containing only 16 drams of laudanum. What if the extra laudanum wasn't consumed? What if it was injected? A rough injection leaving a bruise? It's possible. Did you happen to find any injection marks? No, but I can't say I was looking for one. Well, if the overdose of laudanum was injected, then it wasn't Mrs. Ogden who killed Mrs. Prescott. A revelation like this would immediately discount the Crown's case. It's too late now. She's in the ground. We'll have to get her out. So the alderman was left to his own devices the rest of the day. You know, he could have driven himself down to Port Crater if that was the case. Should we report back to the inspector then? It's not worth much if nobody saw him there. I still think it's strange that they make a visit to the tailors every day. Well, it's this place right here. I tell you, it's the worst tailors I've ever been to. I had to go back three times, and I still don't have my pants. I'd abandon them if they weren't Ruthie's favorite pair. It's hardly bustling. How much revenue can they be making here? Just enough to keep the doors open, I would guess. Yet they make so much that they have to make a deposit at the bank every day? I'm surprised they make enough to make a deposit every year. Higgins! That chap, that's... That's the downtrodden man I saw at the fundraiser earlier. He doesn't look downtrodden at all. Oh, scoundrel, he must be a confidence man. The Scrivener who transcribes the documents for trial was paid to remove two pages. Paid by whom? Apparently not the alderman. We questioned the Scrivener and he gave us a description of the culprit. Inspector McCrae is putting these up all over town. This is the man. I know that man. What? <sighs> My dear Bianca, it's terribly ill. Five minutes of your time. Please. I was on the way to buy the tickets from the train station, and he asked if I wanted a ride. Then he said he needed a doctor. Someone was ill? No, not someone. It was his goat, but there's nothing I could do. By the time I got back to the hotel, Abigail was dead. Julia, did this man speak in an unusual manner? Yes, he had an accent. Well, then this is him. He purposely delayed your return back to the hotel so that someone would have time to murder Abigail Prescott and frame you. This is the man that bribed the Scrivener and delayed Julia on her way back to the hotel. Unlikely to be a coincidence. I have constables canvassing the area and putting up these posters. Hopefully someone will have seen something. I need to speak to Detective Murdoch. Who's this then? Oh, that is Mrs. Lip now. She owns the hotel in Port Credit. Ma'am, may I be of assistance? You need to pay for this phone call. This is your telephone bill. Why should I... Your wife booked a room at my hotel and incurred this exorbitant charge. But now she is in jail. It is only fair that the responsibility of the debt fall to her husband. She has a point, madam. Uh, this must be Abigail Prescott's telephone call. Yes, God rest her soul. But where could she have been calling to incur a charge of one dollar and nineteen cents? A dollar nineteen? I almost keeled over when I saw it. I never should have had that infernal thing installed in the first place. I will take care of this, Mrs. Lipnow. Leave it with me. Why, thank you, Detective. You think that's his office? Could be. An accountant masquerading as a person in need to draw up donations for the Alderman's fundraiser. I can't believe you let that man trick you into giving him money. See, he was convincing, Henry, very convincing. I never should have told you that. 
I still don't see how the tailor shop is connected. Unless it's not a tailor shop at all. Oh, I assure you, there was a tailor in there. An old man with a dreadful shake in his hands. That's not what I mean, Henry. What would an accountant be doing with a failing business right after drumming up money for charity? I'm on the edge of my seat. Pretending that same business earned that same money so no one would notice you and the aldermen were stealing from the people of Toronto. So the tailor shop is just a front then. Oh, look, there he is again. Let's have a word. What have you got? Well, sir, I think I may be able to determine the area that Abigail called with the information in this telephone bill. How do you figure that? All I have to do is cross-reference the cost of the call with the applicable long-distance rates. Won't that take forever? Well, no, sir. A dollar and 19 cents is only divisible by two numbers, 7 and 17. And 1 and 119. Well, yes, but we could probably discount those because there are no regions that cost $1.19 per minute, and we know she wasn't on the telephone for 119 minutes. Go on. So she either made a seven-minute phone call at a rate of 17 cents per minute, or a 17-minute call at a rate... Seven cents a minute. Precisely, which drastically reduces the possibilities. Right, um, here, 17 cents per minute, Paris, Ontario. The alderman doesn't live there. No, but Abigail's mother does. Excuse me, sir. You know the alderman, do you not? <laughs> Doesn't everybody? We saw you at his tailor shop earlier. Why on earth were you spying on me at a tailor shop? Well, what were you doing? Uh, more to the point, were you pretending to be a homeless man earlier at the alderman's fundraiser? How ridiculous. It's not ridiculous, sir. You were drumming up donations, which I think you're now scheming to hide as profits from this tailor shop. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I think you owe my friend here 25 cents, and you owe me a pair of pants. What? So why don't you just tell us, Mr. Potter, if that is indeed your name, how is the alderman involved in all this? <laughs> I don't know why you and your lot continue to pour salt in my wound. Is it not bad enough that your wife caused my daughter's death? This is Delafonte. I'm terribly sorry to ask any more of you. But I assure you, it is important. I'll keep it short. Did your daughter, Abigail, telephone you the night before her death? Yes. She did. What did she say? Abigail telephoned me to tell me that she had absconded with that woman, your wife. Why did she feel the need to tell you this? She was scared, I suppose. Of? What might become of her, of course. A woman can't simply leave her husband. There are consequences for such things, which is precisely what I told her. You told her to go back? Of course. Her husband had broken her arm. Oh, no marriage is a simple affair, detective. And did she agree to return to Toronto? No. She was resolved, come what may. Those were the last words she said to me. <laughs> so you don't believe that she telephoned Mr. Prescott after her conversation with you? I do not. That is why I telephoned him. You? You telephoned Mr. Prescott that night? I did. And you told him where she was? Yes. It's only right. For a husband to know of his wife's whereabouts? <sighs> Mrs. Delafonte, I am very sorry to put you through anything further, but I will need you to attest to this call. Why? I need to present this as evidence to the judge. <sighs> Alderman Prescott has claimed repeatedly that he did not know his wife's whereabouts that night. He lied. Lied to the judge, to the jury, to the investigators. 
Investigators who believe that someone has destroyed evidence in this case. No. He couldn't have. What have I done? So the alderman knew where she was, meaning that he likely went down there to kill her. At the very least, I can now prove to the judge that he lied under oath. What now? Well, I've telephoned Effie Crabtree. We'll get the mother's statement and prepare our case for an appeal. Inspector Brackery? Murder. It's for you. Detective Murdoch. Something bad is about to happen to your wife. What? Next time it's going to be worse. Drop the case. Who is this? Hello? Hey, new girl. Excuse me? Did you steal my cigarettes? No, I don't smoke. I said, give me back my cigarettes. <laughs> It was her. She attacked me. She's lying. She tried to kill me. Well, it doesn't matter. You're both going to the hole. Go ahead. What do you mean I can't speak with her? Where is she? What did they say? Only that she isn't in her cell. I, I have to get down there. Go, go! My lord, there has clearly been outside interference in this case. Just yesterday, I learned that the police scrivener removed two pages of the case file after being bribed. Pages that would make no difference to the outcome of this case. What my learned friend is failing to mention is that there was something about these pages which somebody didn't want the court to know. What were on those pages? The first page detailed a phone call which the deceased made the night before her death to her mother, who in turn telephoned her husband, Alderman Prescott, to retrieve her. Relevance, my lord. A third party at the murder scene completely changes this case and casts a shadow on the theory which my learned friend here laid out at trial. But more importantly, Mr. Prescott lied. He claimed to have no knowledge of his wife's whereabouts at the time of her murder, when in fact, he knew precisely where she was. And the second page? The second page detailed bruising all over the deceased's body. My lord, it seems my friend here has forgotten that the victim died from an overdose of laudanum, not bangs and bruises. Bruises which may well have been covering an injection mark from a syringe which could have been administered by a third party, namely Alderman Prescott. My lord, these are slanderous allegations. Are we now prematurely convicting an innocent man without the benefit of trial? I was under the impression that one had to be convicted by a court of law before being deemed guilty. I am simply articulating a version of events which fits more cleanly with the facts as we now know them. Regardless, these facts cast grave doubt on the conviction of Dr. Ogden in this case. I acknowledge there are discrepancies of some interest, but they do not appear to be significant enough to vacate a conviction, Mrs. Crabtree. Not yet, but they do demand that we re-examine the crucial evidence in this case, the method of death. She died of laudanum. That is not a question. Not the cause, the method which is why I humbly request that the court order the exhumation of the body of Abigail Prescott. To what end? If one of the bruises on her body was covering up an injection mark which was otherwise unaccounted for, then we can assume that the fatal dose was administered by syringe, in which My case Lord. the Crown's allegations against Dr. Ogden no longer hold. My Lord, disturbing a corpse is not a simple thing. It is improper and disrespectful to defile a resting place on a fanciful whim. An exhumation would require permission from the family of the deceased. My lord, Alderman Prescott will not provide such permission. If we asked, and he denies, can we put this whole matter to rest? It has been proven Mr. Prescott lied in this court. We cannot let this decision lie in his hands. As it so happens, the Alderman is not the deceased's only family. Mrs. Crabtree, if you can obtain permission from Mrs. Prescott's mother, I will approve the exhumation. I want to see Julia Ogden immediately. Detective Murdoch. Thank you. Your wife is fine. Where is she? 
She was in an altercation with another inmate and received a laceration on her forearm. What? But she is otherwise in fine health. Take me to her immediately. I cannot. She's had to spend the night in the hole, just like any other inmate would. We take these sorts of altercations very seriously. Has her wound been treated? Yes. The wound was cleaned and bandaged. Our nurses are well trained. Mr. Warden, I, I received a telephone call threatening Julia's life. We need to put a guard on her at all times, more than one if possible. I have no way of knowing who is making these threats. Detective, you sound paranoid. I received this telephone call at the station house. Uh -huh. I'll see to it that she receives additional supervision for the time being. Thank you. <coughs> Sounds like a smoker's cough. No wonder you wanted your cigarettes back so badly. Keep provoking me. See what happens, sweetie. You know, I don't believe your cigarettes were ever missing. It was just an excuse to attack me. Oops. Did someone put you up to it? I wouldn't have pegged you for the type of lady with a long list of enemies. But here we are. Who was it? Wouldn't you like to know? I don't blame you. I don't care one way or the other. I know what it's like to be a woman in a vulnerable position, being manipulated by people with bad intentions. That sounds like a long and fancy way to say you pity me, huh? I hate pity. That's not it. Whoever hired you is just using you to do their dirty work while you take the fall. You could have been hurt. <laughs> or you could have killed me and ended up with a lifetime sentence. People like that don't deserve to be protected. $50. I beg your pardon? That's my price. $50 and I'll give you the name. Murdoch. Mrs. Prescott's exhumation has been approved. The mother agreed to it. It will commence first thing tomorrow morning. That is good news. Who will perform the examination? The original coroner, but overseen by Miss Hart. The judge has agreed to send the body to our morgue. Oh? Why is that? Apparently, every man and his dog wants to attend. We're the only ones with the space for it. I see. I would also like to attend. Good luck getting the judge to approve that. Look, don't worry. I'll make sure everything goes off all right. If we can find that syringe, Mark, this will all be over. And if we don't find it? We have to exonerate Julia now. She was attacked in prison. Her life's in danger. So they're stealing from charitable citizens? That's what we suspect, sir. That behavior's lower than a snake's belly. But this chap even pretended to have a bum leg to garner donations out of sympathy. An absolute disgrace. Where is he now? Uh, he got away, sir. He was actually surprisingly fast on his feet. But this tailor shop is the center of it. That's where they're taking all the money. It seems so. Take a few of the lads and ransack the place. Gladly. Well, sir, do we need to speak to a judge first? Look, we know they're as guilty as sin. Better to beg forgiveness than ask permission is what I always say. Sir. Toronto and Sandler! Help! In Who's there? Higgins! Master! Grant! Mr. Potter! Are you alright? I'm alive! That's what you're asking. Do you know who that man was? I don't know. He got away. The lads are still after him. Did you recognize him? No. From the police sketch. That's the alderman's henchman. You were sent by Mr. Prescott? Mm. 
I very much admire your work, Miss Hart. Oh, thank you. I've read about you in the papers. You're quite the inspiration for those of us entering the field. Hmm. Was that so? Everyone was all abuzz after those witch killings you solved last year. Oh. Ergot poisoning. Imagine that. Actually, the victim died of anaphylaxis, but I appreciate the sentiment. Shall we begin? Of course. Okay. Case 583, the exhumation of Abigail Prescott. She hasn't been in the ground for so long. It seems the cold conditions have helped. Mr. Wright and I will now examine the skin for puncture or injection marks. They didn't find anything. Nothing? There were no puncture wounds or syringe marks present anywhere on her body. We were wrong. I'm sorry. Detective William Murdoch. William, I found out who sent that inmate to try and kill me. You did? Who? Oh. His name is Gunnar Bjornsson. His description matches that of the farmer who bribed the Scrivener. Oh, and I need you to send $50 to an address for me. Getting that name wasn't cheap. It may not make any difference. The exhumation was a failure. It, it yielded nothing. What, what does that mean? Without the syringe mark or the missing pages, anything this Bjornsson has done becomes circumstantial. Inconsequential. Oh. I'm so sorry, Julia. a small mark on her lip. Where? Here. Hmm. It just makes me think, if not a syringe mark, perhaps someone forced the victim's mouth open in some way. Giving her laudanum against her will? Precisely. I would have noticed a chipped tooth or pierced lip. Beyond that, I don't see how such a thing could ever be established. Did you examine the inside of her mouth? Yes, but I admit, not with a specific mind to finding such indicators. You sure this man works for Prescott? Absolutely. Man's trying to kill me. After everything I've done for him. What exactly have you done for him? I'm not telling you a thing. Sir, as you can see, constables are collecting every scrap of paperwork in this place, and others will be searching your accounting office. And what of it? If you've been stealing from charity, we'll find out whether you help us or not. Why are you protecting someone who wants you dead? If I help you convict him, can you keep me out of jail? That may be something we can arrange. I've been in charge of the Alderman's accounts for over a decade. And he has been indeed stealing money. From the hospital charity? Among others. We run the donations through the tailor shop so that they appear as legitimate earnings when we deposit them. And then I talk to the financials to ensure it. Stealing from a hospital is particularly rotten. The hospital is just the tip of the iceberg. Is everything all right? Just having a quick look at one more thing. Now, hold on. The purpose of this exhumation was to search for a syringe mark. It will just take one moment. This examination was not explicitly requested. What is that? Oh, my. Colonel Bjornsson, 
criminal threats, assault, attempted murder, and there's more. Oh. The last time he was in jail, he was bailed out by none other than Alderman Prescott. That's a direct connection. We have his last known address. The lads and I will bring him in. And Crabtree and Higgins have managed to get the accountant to spill. The alderman's going down one way or another. The only problem is none of this exonerates Julia. McNeil? We have word from the morgue, sirs. Good up, Johnson. The one and only. You're under arrest for bribery, interference with a police investigation, and attempted murder. Can I finish my stool first? Don't get smart. Get him out of here. What a waste. Thank you for your patience. We have completed our examination of the exhumed body of Abigail Prescott. There were no previously undiscovered markings on the skin. However, we were able to find an anomaly that was not discovered in the original postmortem. Yes, a foreign object in the deceased's mouth, stuck in the back of her esophagus. The object seems to have moved closer to the top of the throat due to the body's decomposition. Hence why it wasn't previously found, despite Mr. Wright's good work. A brass button. A button? Why would she have swallowed a button? No, I didn't. Is that all? Good day, detective. It was him. I have already signed the petition and expect to have a plan in place as early as next week. Please excuse me for a moment. Detective Murdoch. Of course. So what do I owe the pleasure? Oh, believe me, Alderman. The pleasure is all mine. Is that so? Dear, I thought you didn't like me. I don't. What are you doing? That is quite enough of this harassment, Detective. Alderman Prescott, you are under arrest for the murder of your wife, Abigail Prescott. Every piece of evidence detailing the alderman's misdeeds. It's time enough to send him away for years to come. Evidence of his financial crimes and the button that places him at the scene of the murder. Mrs. Prescott was sending us a message. You think she swallowed it on purpose? Or? In her final moments, yes. Bringing him to justice from beyond the grave. In addition to all of that, this Bjornson fella turned on the alderman faster than a lion's lunch. He admitted to distracting Dr. Ogden while the alderman murdered his wife. I'd be willing to wager that that is finally the end of Alderman Prescott. There is no doubt of your innocence now. I'm so relieved, William. Effie said the Crown will ask the judge to overturn the verdict in the morning. I'll be released by noon. That's wonderful. I can hardly stand the thought of you spending one more night here. Me neither. Although... The warden has extended an olive branch in light of my wrongful imprisonment. He's invited me to a family dinner. Oh? <laughs> mm -hmm.